G'day, folks. You are going to love, love, love this episode this week with Sydney Finkelstein, the author of Super Bosses. I bet in your past you've had, hopefully, at least one or two super bosses, bosses that you'll never forget, that left a massive footprint on your professional development and career, the kind of boss that you strove for, that you wanted to work harder for, that you gave absolutely everything, the ones that wanted you to take risks and made you take risks and you felt safe knowing that you weren't going to be shamed if you failed. What are the characteristics, though, that make up these super bosses? That's what we're going to be unpacking today on this podcast. Make sure you listen right to the end. We're going to be teaching you the characteristics of super bosses, what are the one or two big things that you really need to avoid as a leader that you may not realize that you're doing that could become a huge problem and derail all your best efforts to attract um, great people into your team and to retain them and get the most out of them. And then finally, Sydney's going to give you some uh, insights and access to something that he's just launched and just released uh, that will be a huge, uh, valuable resource in this whole area. Enjoy today. Thanks for listening. Welcome to the Scale Ups Podcast, where each week you get to hear Sean Steele, professional CEO, growth mentor, and advisory board chair, unpack the strategies that successful founders have used to achieve scale in their businesses. Stay tuned as he interviews the entrepreneurs who've made it, learns from industry experts, and follows a group of founders still striving to scale. G'day, everybody, and welcome to the Scale Ups Podcast, where we help first-time founders learn the secrets of scaling so they can fundamentally you know, scale their businesses, fulfill the potential of their businesses, maximize the impact they can have in the world, and make bigger decisions with greater confidence. I am your host, Sean Steele, and before I give you a bit of an introduction uh, to our guest today, Sydney Finkelstein, uh, just a quick shout out to Big W52, who left a review on Apple Podcasts the other day saying... Just binge listen to the first few episodes of this, and you've now got 28 uh, episodes to binge listen to, uh, Big W52. I'm adding this to my regular podcast listens, great interviews and topics. We're thrilled to have you in the community. Uh, thanks so much. We appreciate you taking the time out. You know, Folks, it only takes a few seconds of your time, but I can tell you for our team, uh, and certainly not just me, there's, it feels like a big bear hug uh, for us, and we, we love hearing your thoughts on what you like and also what you'd like to see in future episodes. But I'd like to welcome, without further ado, Sydney Finkelstein, professor at Tux School of Business uh, at Dartmouth, host of the Sidcast podcast, author of numerous books, uh, Sydney, including Super Bosses, uh, probably uh, 2016, I think that was uh, published. Is that right? How Exceptional Leaders Master the Flow of Talent. Uh, welcome to the Scale Arts podcast, Sydney. How are you today? Thank you so much for having me, Sean. It's great to be talking to you and all of your listeners. It's such a great topic that you've got on scaling up. I can't imagine too many things much more important, so let's go for it. Beautiful. Sounds great. Well, you know, I'm really excited about our conversation because I do a lot of work uh, on advisory boards and mentoring with founders who are trying to scale their businesses up, you know, either one to one or one to two with co-founders and talent. You know, it, it's come out, it comes up in every conversation at the moment, um, particularly in the last, you know, sort of six months. We've never been in a tighter labor market uh, and skills market than we have right now. And so the conversations around how do we attract them? How do we nurture them? How do we empower them? How do we retain them? How do we inspire them? But rarely is the question asked, you know, what do I need to do differently to become the kind of leader, um, the kind of boss that people would fall over to get access to? Because uh, it's probably a pretty confronting question, right? You know, many of us, I think, have worked for maybe, I don't know what you're, I mean, you, you, I would look forward to hearing your experience. I've had two, what I would consider super bosses uh, in my time who were exceptionally influential in my development. And you just never forget those people. Did you have some yourself on the way up? You, you said it exactly right. You never forget. You absolutely never forget those people. I've had um, probably three in my life, which is a lot. Um, and each one different stage, one very early, one kind of as I was learning my trade, so to speak. And then one when I was really, when I was doing my own scaling up and uh, this was just a really wise a senior colleague who uh, took me under his wing and uh, taught me a lot of what he what he knows, and also opened doors for me as well. But you know the um, the first the first one happened when I was uh, I was I think twenty maybe twenty three, mm -hmm. uh, really early on, and I was actually teaching um, in Canada, in Montreal. I'm a Canadian by birth, and um, I was I was teaching. I didn't have a PhD. I wasn't doing research. I I was just having a good time. I enjoyed it, and he basically fired me. And he told me, you know, you're, you're doing great, but if you want to be serious about this career, this is what you need to do. And I'm not going to, basically he said, I'm not going to <laughs> exploit you because I was a young guy. I was a lot cheaper than some of the, uh, some of the old timers that they could have brought in and I was doing a great job. And, um, but it wasn't going to help me in the long term, um, even though I 
didn't I didn't really know that at the time. And that that changed a lot. Wow. Yeah, it, it reminds me of my first sort of reality check. Um, you know, I'd, I'd sort of found myself in sales after university and I just found it was something that I was actually really good at. And I made, you know, a couple of, you know, probably three or $400,000 in my first 18 months as a 20 year old uh, in sales. And, but I, you know, I had ambition. So I sought out this you know, general manager who was a pretty young general manager, but he was quite senior in our business. It was a big business. And I said, how do I, how do I get to a general manager one day? And he said, well, it's great. You know, you really kicking ass in sales and that's, that's all great. And you're making a lot of money at the moment, but I've got a I've got a job for you. You're going to need to learn operations and customer service and quality and all these other things. So I've got a terrible job for you. It's in a, you'd have to move cities. Um, you're currently probably making, you know, a few hundred thousand a year. I'm going to pay you 45,000 a year. Um, it's a terrible team. No one has any, all this works going into them and no works coming out of them. So it's basically a big bottleneck. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be really hard to fix, but if you really want to cut your teeth, that's what you're going to have to do. And it was like a pivotal moment uh, in my career that changed my whole my whole mentality, uh, and that was that was the first uh, of those couple. Could you maybe kick us off, Sydney, by giving the audience a bit of a sneak peek into what inspired you to do the research that underpinned the development of your, uh, I guess, of the concept around super bosses and the, and the characteristics of them, uh, so we can then sort of get stuck into what those are and, and then how do people, uh, what do we have to do differently? You know, there was um, uh, there's an overt reason and maybe an implicit one I didn't realize at the time. And the, the overt one was I had written a book called Why Smart Executives Fail. And mm. uh, it's a good title, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and it really took off. It was a global bestseller. And when you when you do that, you know, you're invited all over the place. And I gave a lot of talks, a lot of um, um, kind of workshops with C-suite people. And, and it was all about, you know, the different reasons why companies collapse. And it, a lot of it had to do with people, but it was also strategic thinking, organizational issues. And I was starting to get a question after a period of time that I, I, I thought I had answered. But because I kept getting the question, I had to realize, you know, I hadn't answered it at least well enough. And the question was, okay, we understand what can go wrong and how to avoid falling into these traps. But what should we do so that we're, we're never even in this type of conversation? We're just flying high and we're growing and we're generating and regenerating all the way through. And, uh, and it's not just the opposite of avoiding failure. And, mm, uh, mm. and that got me started in thinking about what that is. And it didn't take long, and maybe this is the implicit part, um, it didn't take long for me to come up with a hypothesis, which was that if you really want to survive and thrive into the long term, you need to be able to develop talent not just once, twice, five times, I mean, continuously. So people will come and go, and we'll talk about that. You can't change the fact that some people will go. Um, uh, and probably many of your listeners have left something to start something, so they, they, they'll understand. Uh, and, and so uh, yeah, I, had this, I had this notion that, you know, people that, that had this ability to generate and regenerate talent on a continual basis, these were the, these were the ones that maybe give me the, the clue, the key, to understanding how you really can survive, thrive, and succeed in the long term, and 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 that's that eventually became super bosses. Those people that that mm, what mm. it's almost definitional to what ended up happening. Yeah, super boss. Yeah. I have a lot of definitions, but the the simplest is the ability to generate and regenerate talent on a continual basis. Generate and regenerate talent, and I actually just to go back on something you said early on, which I think is really important. You said that what you're doing to become a super boss and the characteristics of those is not necessarily the opposite of the things that make people fail. Cause it's almost like in my head, it just, I had this image of, it's almost like it's in thirds, you know, there's the stuff that makes things go really wrong. There's the stuff that's just a whole bunch of average and it's not really good or bad, but it's just sort of, you know, mediocre. It's okay. It's, it's not bad, but it's not great. And then you've got the stuff that actually really is the, is the transformational sort of next level up where you're, where you're generating and regenerating talent. Is that, is that a kind of fair assumption? Is that what, is that something that you've discovered? So certainly there are things that, that can lead to failure that if you avoid them, it, it'll give you some success. But to really get the home runs, um, I think it's a different, it's a kind of a different ball of wax. Mm. And one thing that I discovered um, during, do, during the time I was doing the research on sewer bosses, which was almost a 10-year project, I, um, I began to see some similarities between some of the why smart executives fail senior executives and CEOs and some of the super boss CEOs. And that caused me some uh, some uh, sleepless nights because how could how could they be similar? Uh, how could there be some similarities mm. because they they have completely opposite trajectories and results? And um, and happily I figured it out. <laughs> um, and what I figured out is that uh, it, it, it's all about how they treat and think about people and how they think and manage teams. And the why smart executives fail um, executives uh, or CEOs really they. Um, 
they needed people only because that would help them succeed in their own life, their own career. That's the only reason they cared right. about anyone else. And and you know most of us could see through people like that. The the super mm. boss leaders were driven to succeed, but they understood that the only way they could do it, and this is true even for the toughest of these of these people, the only way they're going to do it is by building some of the world's greatest teams and keep helping them get better and better. And and in a sense, it's kind of like, of course, how could that not be true? But I've gotten plenty of pushback from people and say, well, no one did that for me, uh, which is a ridiculous argument, mm. but that's that's what people say sometimes, right? So did you see similar behaviors or just, you know, similar concept in that they, that they knew they needed to build a team? They just had completely different motivations and, and purpose for that building. They, they had, that's right. Um, I mean, there were some similarities, not that they were all uh, all similar. The, the similarities related mm. to their tremendous self-confidence, their their ability right. to build something, this, the the why smart executives fail leaders, they built it and they, they then they destroyed it, and, the, and that did not happen with the super boss <laughs> leaders. Um, you know, famous book is good to great. So in a sense, I was looking at great to not very good at all. <laughs> um, so there was a there, there was a similarity in uh, in some of the personality types, um, not entirely, but somewhat. But really, when you look at the behaviors, the actions, which is what I spent almost all the time in super bosses. You know, I'm, I'm focused on what people do or could do because, I, you know, I can't change somebody's DNA. I can't change somebody's personality. Mm. I can teach you all kinds of techniques to become more effective as a leader. And so that was the focus. And that's where there was a gigantic difference. Right. So could you unpack for us then, all right, well, what are those characteristics and what are those you know behaviors that you're seeing in super bosses that you found at the end of that research were the things that sort of held it together. There's, there's, a, there's a lot. So I'll give you a couple of highlights, and we can go, we can go deeper. Mm. Um, actually, I'll say there's, there's, let's say there's three main um, bundles of behavior. Uh, one is around, call it inspiration. Um, we talk about inspirational mm-hmm. leaders, and everyone understands the word inspiration. But I always challenge management teams and managers. Um, are they really inspirational? How do they know if they're inspirational? What does inspiration actually mean? And and what it meant for super bosses is they would tell they would true they they would talk to their team and they would they would share with their team how they believe that what they were doing together was uh, um, was really changing the world in some way. I mean, even in Ralph Lauren fashion industry, is, are you changing the world? You know, compared to some other people. Well, in in, in that sector how people thought about clothes and how they came across. Yeah. And Ralph Lauren, for example, used to say, you know, we won't follow anyone. Uh, we're going to set the standards. They're, they might try to copy us, but we're never going to do that. And he, he was authentic. He believed it. And that starts to rub off on, mm. on, on people. And, you know, there's also this thing, how do you perceive the bumps in the road? How, you know, it's almost like a, a coach in a, um, in a sports and a team or a captain of a team. How are they reacting when it gets really rough? Are they going berserk? Are they, are they losing it? Or is there some calmness that, that, that then exudes itself to other people? And I've certainly, I've found that to be a big, a big thing. And so when there's a lot of change going on, which there are, there's endless change now, but when there's a lot of change going on in a company, mm-hmm. In a, in a business, is it being perceived as a threat or is it being perceived as an opportunity? And of course, it could be a little bit of both. But to the, the extent of which you can redefine something that looks a little scary and say, okay, we can't deny it. We got to do something about it. Can we can we think about how to how to create some? And isn't that exactly what entrepreneurs are all about? The, the word in, entre, in the entrepreneurial mm-hmm. world is pivot for what I just said, uh, which everyone, yeah. everyone talks about. So inspiration yeah. and vision building is I like, the first of I- those three. And I, and Sydney, I like that. I really like that concept. And I've noticed that one thing that I see is a characteristic of leaders that I know who really have the attention of their team and, and the engagement uh, with their team are they, you know, I don't know where I heard this metaphor a long time ago, but the concept of sort of putting the scorpion on the table. It's like, well, if everybody's sitting in a meeting room and there's a scorpion running around on the floor, there are some leaders who will just, you know, they're so in the moment, they're so sort of blinded, they just won't even talk about the scorpion. The people are really worried about the scorpion, but it's just running around rampant. The, the leader who's really going to engage a team picks the scorpion, sticks it in the middle of the table and goes, hey, there's a scorpion in the middle of the table. What are we going to do about that? And everyone's like, oh, yeah, okay, well, at least it's just, it's brought into the, it's brought into the light, it's brought into the arena. And then all of a sudden people aren't pretending that, oh, my, my leader's omnipotent and knows everything and has some crystal ball. And I can imagine that some of the leaders that, um, that uh, end up in failure are the ones who just ignore, don't, don't worry about that. We're just going this way, like kind of put your blinkers on, just keep moving. 
and the ones who get engagement are actually the ones who bring it to the surface, deal with it, talk about it, and they actually deny yeah, deny don't it have to more than got anything all the else. Failing leaders, uh, it doesn't exist. Mm. It's just it's just not there. It's like COVID doesn't exist. Um, there are people who said such a thing, and um, and boom, and mm-hmm. yeah, that that's what that's what happened. And you know, you gain more credibility with people around you when you say the obvious and 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 pretend that something that is, everyone could see is is not there. You actually lose credibility, but somehow that equation which mm-hmm. is kind of simple gets turned on its head sometimes and people yeah i mean i've had leaders tell me that they're, they're afraid to acknowledge what what that scorpion is if you will what the mistake is what the problem is because yeah, it's yeah. going to reflect badly on them yeah, but it's yeah. quite the opposite yeah it is the opposite and takes courage though it takes courage to get there and to, to have that level of humility and but it absolutely is what builds trust and so i think it's also quite different to say well let's you know let's bring it out of the table let's expose it and then let's kind of just swim around and not really do anything. That's not very helpful either. Um, people still want you to lead and still be, I want to want you to help kind of create a path, but with their input, with their, you know, with everybody on board with that. That's exactly right. It's not enough to just call it out. You got to do something about it. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you there. You, you, you carry forward. So inspiration and, 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 um, and even vision, which is kind of the most overused word, word around. People get tired of it because everyone talks about it, but actually it's important. And to me, the question that you want to you want to answer when it comes to vision is it's a very simple question. Why do we exist as a team or as a company or as a startup or as, a, as a anything? Why, I mean, it's a, it's a hard question, right? Why do we exist? You don't have, nobody grants anyone the right to, I mean, there's some exceptions, but to, to, to have the right to, re- exi- to exist, it requires some legitimacy. You have to be doing something important. And part of it is, you know, somebody's got to be willing to pay you for whatever it is you're doing. Uh, but the other part is mm-hmm. you got to be doing something kind of good for the world in some tiny way because maybe maybe that wasn't true you know 100 it wasn't true 100 years ago or maybe even 50 years ago you know people did whatever they did and there's plenty i'm sure examples today where 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 that's still going on but um legitimacy in the eyes of um not just regulators and government but employees we're talking about talent um i could you know i mm-hmm. teach mba students most of the time and their average age is about 28 let's say and uh, i have seen a sea change mm-hmm. in their in how they how they show up over the course of my my 30 year career doing this and uh, they are uh, they really do care about esg about environmental social and governance issues they really do care about diversity equity and inclusion all these words that are thrown around and we have these acronyms for them they're they're not they're, they're going to select companies they're going to work for or they're going to consult for, or they're going to really invest 100% of themselves in, uh, in part, not only, but in part yeah. on the basis of whether whether these leaders in these companies are, are kind of walking the talk. And that's that's the vision question. Why do you exist? What, what's your purpose here? I think that's a, it's a, it's a great question. And I know a number of founders who find that really difficult because they didn't start their business with of sort of purpose in mind they started it because they thought it was something they could do it made money they liked the model and so they they like it and it's sort of and it's nice but it wasn't purpose driven to start with and so the conversation i end up having with them is well why don't you talk to your customers about actually what this means to them what was happening before what was happening before they engaged you what was the trigger event that made them call you in the first place what is it they want to do after they've worked with you what's coming after this how are they going to be using your product or your service because in there, you'll probably find there's actually something far more emotional or helpful that you didn't understand, which may ignite your understanding of what what the purpose of the business could be if you didn't start with one. Because that is quite a, I think it's tough for people to wrestle with. There's many businesses, of course, that have started with a really massive and transformative sort of purpose. But the ones I think find it more difficult, um, you know, are sort of stuck in that it's, it's just a business. But to your point, you don't attract the best teams. You, you, you're never going to attract top players without some level of them understanding how they can contribute because they want something that's big in them. They want to know that they can contribute to something. They want to know that they're going to develop in that organization, um, but that it's going to be meaningful to them. And I agree with you. In the last 10 sort of 15 years, it feels like it's just been a huge, huge shift where people used to be sort of, I don't know, grateful for the job. And now they're like, well, you know, I, I know I've got capability. I know I've got lots of options. So show me what I'm doing here. Like, what, what are you actually trying to achieve? really is really right especially this idea of going to your customers and finding out doing your own market research not about you know traditional things we do but your your fundamental purpose i think it's a very smart very smart idea and yeah people want more um and 
it's been going on for a while. Mm-hmm. I think COVID has accelerated, has kind of more than accelerated, it's kind of exploded when people are seeing what's going on around the world, around, well, never mind around the world, with their own friends and family. Everyone knows someone who, who, who actually, a lot of people at this point who have gotten sick and, and some people, unfortunately, that, that didn't make it or were dealing with a lot. And so you question it and you say, what, what am I doing? Why am I working so hard? Why, why should I do that? What's, what, what is my purpose mm-hmm. as an individual? And that's why they're leaving because they don't feel like it's being fulfilled. And if that's not a wake up call for, for, you know, employers and for companies, I don't know, I don't know what is. And, and you know what, it is a wake up call because um, <laughs> they, there's just not, they're not getting the people they need and they can't grow and they can't, they can't accomplish what they want to. Uh, it's just important to think about why is this going on? And yeah, yeah. the solution is not an extra $10,000, although no one's going to throw out $10,000. Uh, the solution is, um, lead with meaning, create meaning for, for what you're doing and engage people mm-hmm. that care about that. I also think, you know, when I think about the context of leadership, I always think that, you know, leadership is partly about creating meaning for action. So, you know, if you're not able to translate why we would be sort of, you know, tackling a particular strategy or, and you can't link that, that thing together, how are they supposed to understand how are they supposed to find the motivation in that? So you're kind of assuming that, you know, you're kind of playing in this middle ground where you can, and you can, you know what, you can actually build a business that's relatively successful in the middle, in that middle segment uh, where it's okay. And okay, maybe it's not that purpose driven. And maybe you've probably got a whole bunch of B grade players uh, in, you know, in the business and actually it can be pretty stable and it can be profitable and so on. But if you actually really want to get to the next level, you know that you need people who are, um, at the top of their field, you know, you're going to have to hire some super talent. And at some point, if you haven't done these things, that's not going to happen. What, what are the other, what are the other, uh, I guess, sort of success characteristics? Yeah. So the, the first was around inspiration and, 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 and vision. The, the second is, I call it unleashing the creativity of the people around you. So we spend so much time trying to find good people and then we tell them everything they should do and report back and do what I tell you to do. And I mean, that's, that's just plain dumb, isn't it? Um, if you can have great people, then give them a mm-hmm. chance to be great. And, and I, the terminology I use is unleashing the creativity of the people around you. And, you know, th- this is also not a nice to have. This is a requirement because you look at millennials and Gen Z, they're kind of showing up expecting a seat at the table. Uh, and a lot of people criticize that, you know, what have they done? They don't have the experience. But super boss style leadership, if you will, they'll give them the seat. They won't get mm-hmm. tenure in the seat. Mm-hmm. They're gonna have to produce, and and that seat will be taken away. Uh, but the but the 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 kind of the burden of proof shifts, and they're getting, they're being given that opportunity, and um, and so unleashing creativity means, and, and I use the word creativity on purpose, because a lot of people don't think that's a business type word. It's for the arts, but in fact, it's a personal word, creativity. The other word we use mm-hmm. is innovation, obviously, and people are more comfortable with innovation because it's a business like word, but. I, I kind of like to push the envelope a little bit because it's it's about each individual and, and that's your own your own creativity. So um, um, being innovative, being creative as a leader is important. Hiring people that care about that care about this super boss leaders, when they interview talent, uh, they're probing um, some examples that they could latch on to of people that have some creative mm. skill or creative aptitude, or at least some interest. And creativity is not necessarily drawing something that's a you know a beautiful drawing. It's like asking a good question. Mm. That's a pretty good thing, right? I've always thought that the ability to ask great questions is as valuable as almost anything else. Because if you ask the wrong question, you could have the greatest execution in the world, but you're gonna, you're gonna be in trouble. If you ask the right question, and um, even without perfect execution, you're probably gonna be okay. So. So the second, so um, Sydney, did you find um, in that because uh, you know you you brought into my mind my second super boss straight away when you said that because I thought it was my first executive role, uh, so it was a big step up for me. I had a much bigger team than I was than I was used to. There was a lot of pressure. It was quite a public sort of role, uh, very large organization, and my boss was very much like, well, "Show me the strategy. You tell me the strategy, and I'm going to back you." and but what I noticed was that there was an underlying sense of you've got to deliver, but you're also going to be safe if you screw it up a little bit along the way. And as he grew in confidence, as I was able to deliver, he gave me more and more. Like, I don't think I actually made any requests for capital allocation, you know, money to fund anything. I don't think I ever got a no because 
I was willing to take risks and I backed myself, but I also knew that if I screwed it up along the way, there'd be a sense of safety where I wasn't going to be castrated publicly or shamed in front of everybody. Uh, there was going to be private conversations where I was actually going to be helped to address it and to do it better, which was actually a really, did you notice that that's, because one thing is kind of hoping they unleash the creativity, but that means hopefully people can take risks, right? So then the question in someone's mind is, well, what if I take a risk and I screw this up? What's going to be the the outcome of that? And then am I still willing to take that risk based on what so I expect? Here, here we see the comparison between the why smart executives fail leaders and the super boss leaders, because it's sta- it was standard practice. If you screwed up, the why smart executives fail leaders would come down hard and it, would, it wouldn't, wouldn't be a happy situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was, uh, that was standard. Mm-hmm. And of course, people are not stupid. They figure that out and they, you know, they, you keep your head, you keep your head down and the people that refuse to keep their mm-hmm. head down, they leave. And those are the people that change things. And so you're, you're left with, as you said earlier, B players or C players, but, um, mm-hmm. um, taking a risk and failing for the right reason is important. You know, you could, you could take risks and do kind of things that you shouldn't, have, you shouldn't have done. Uh, so one, one example that came up in, um, my research is, uh, in the advertising industry, Jay Shiat, who was the founder of Shiat Day, um, very famous advertising agency in the day, in the day, um, they had created a very famous ad for the Apple Macintosh when it came out. Um, um, that I think in advertising history has been seen as one of the one of the greatest ads ever because IBM was a dominant player in those days, and here was the Mac and IBM were. Uh, we're kind of walking off a cliff by not changing. It was really a classic Steve Jobs moment, mm-hmm. and they put it together. In any event, Jay mm-hmm. Shiat, um, I interviewed some of the people who worked for Jay Shiat, and uh, one um, one person told me a story about how they you know, it was advertising, so they're making a pitch for a client for for a program for uh, you know a um, um, you know a whole, a whole package of things they want to do, and they didn't get the deal. They, they went with someone else, and the reason they didn't get the deal is because they were. Um, almost too creative or too far out there for the for the client the client um, wanted just kind of a standard type of thing and uh, so no one's happy you lost the deal um, but Jay Shy had actually gave each person on that team a bonus afterwards and of course word spreads like wildfire in a company about that and he said the reason why you're getting a bonus is not that I like failure but you fail for the right reason you failed because you went for it, and that's what we're all about. That's what our culture is. That's how we differentiate. That's our mission. That's our purpose. And and if we're going to make a mistake, let's always make the mistake because we are being we are being uh, so creative. Um, and let's never make the mistake that we're timid. And um, think about the cul- the culture impact. Yeah, because you can fail just as yeah you can fail just as easily, right? You know, too conservative. Actually, you can just totally miss the mark. Uh, but yeah. No, with no upside, it's kind of like a, it's like an asynchronous downside. You know, like at best, it's going to be average. At worst, it's going to be catastrophic. You know Whereas like, at least yeah, if you go for it, you got an asynchronous upside that, opportunity. Uh, in my view, it's like best practice, which gets a lot of people crazy. I'm not a fan of best practice because best practice means catching up to yesterday's ideas from your competitors, mm-hmm. and they're not staying still. They're on to the next thing, and and so it's kind of like you just totally. you're you're like a donkey, kind of following the 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 lead horse far ahead of you, and you're never gonna you're never gonna catch up, and you're never gonna try to do something on your own. So yeah, you know that's a slight overstatement. There's certain things where best practice has some value, but you can't let it dominate your thinking. Yeah, I think. Um... One of my one of my guests, and I can't remember who was who said this, but uh, they called it next practice. They're like, yeah, we don't do best practice. We don't look at our. We actually we don't spend time thinking about our competitors. We think about what's coming next because we've got to find different ways of solving problems for our customers that no one's even thinking about. If we spend all our time looking at our competitors, to your point, we're just going to end up replicating stuff that they do. And the problem with that is the more that you try to compete on the more things, you end up just squeezing margins. You can't do everything. You know, you, you have to deselect. Uh, you have to deselect things and compete on stuff that actually nobody else is doing. Otherwise, you can never build a competitive advantage because you want to get so far down the track of something that really matters to your customer that no one else is kind of willing to do perhaps that the competitors, when they realize what you're doing, you're already three years ahead and they're going, actually, I don't even think we can catch up with that. So now they don't even try. Yeah. yeah. There's a famous um, case study, business school case study that's been it's been used for, for decades about a company called... Um, I think Liberty Electric, okay. maybe. Um, I might be wrong on that, but I think that's what it's called. And um, 
they were always known as the most innovative company in the world. Go back to World War II and the war effort, and they were very active in it, and they opened their doors and invited all of their competitors to see everything they were doing because it was part of the war, the war effort. And, um, and then even after the war, they, they invited tours of competitors to come into the, this is a manufacturing company, and it didn't matter. They were always ahead of everyone else because all they were seeing is what was going on in the past or present to be accurate. And they were always going, whether that's next practice or what you want to call it, they were always going for the next thing. It's also relevant for super bosses because you're going to lose some great talent along the way. Well, is, is that person that leaves, are they going to walk away with kind of your, your game plan and then you're, you're going to be out of business? Well, if that's the case, shame on you because it means you're, you're static. You're not continually mm. adapting, adjusting, yeah, yeah. changing. And so you're not, not only unleashing creativity of people around you, you're not allowing yourself, not, you're not building a culture. I always think if you're not moving forward, there is no still, like there's no static. If you're not actually moving forward, you're already moving backwards because other people are moving forward. So you need to be moving forward at twice the speed uh, of everybody else because there is no yeah, staying still. It doesn't really exist. There's there's some theory in physics, I think, that says that. <laughs> is that- <laughs> yeah, I talked <laughs> about it in some way. I don't know. Anyways, the third uh, the third thing I was going to tell you about super bosses that what they do is mm. – um, historically, the way that people learn their trade, learned how to do whatever it is they're doing, is in a master-apprentice relationship. You worked at the foot of a master and you, you learn. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci, who I read about in the book as an example, Leonardo da Vinci learned uh, so much about about art and, um, and tapestry and, 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 and other types of arts from being in the, um, in the workshop of Verrocchio in Renaissance Italy. And, you know, Leonardo da Vinci was born kind of pretty smart and pretty capable, but that's how he started. And the question is, where, where, where is that today? Where are those master apprentice relationships? Now, of course, we have that for the trades, you know, for carpenters or, or plumbers or, I mean, a bunch of places like that. But management, leadership, business building, we don't, we generally don't have it, with the exception of super bosses that have done it. And, and the way they've done it is, um, uh, there's a bunch of things they've done, but just to highlight a couple of them. One is that they're, um, they're teachers. I, I wrote an article in the Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago that the best leaders are the best teachers. Um, and they're really doing one-on-one teaching, not doing it all the time. You've got a lot of other things you're doing. But every time you interact with someone, you look at it as a teaching opportunity. And, and what are you teaching? You could be teaching about the business, uh, some technical aspect perhaps. You could be teaching from your own experience. You could be teaching about life even. I, I mean, I even found that to be the case. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, so, so they're teachers. They think about themselves as teachers, uh, which I think is really kind of kind of cool. And then the second thing they do, um, or the second thing I'll highlight, there are other things, is they customize how they work with each person in their team, which I think is a really mm-hmm. smart idea. And so, you know, we know everyone's different. Why do we treat everyone the same? Why do we think that equity requires every single person on a team to be treated in an identical way? That is such a illogical idea. We live in a world of mass customization for everything. You know, go put something into the Google, a search term, and it tells mm-hmm. you what you're doing before you're done. It's a little spooky, but but we don't do that nearly as much when it comes to managing talent, managing people. And you can do it very practically by just spending the time working with each person one-on-one, having conversations with them, where what you want to understand is, what you want to learn is, well, what makes them tick? How do they, how do they get motivated? I mean, what motivates them? Uh, not everyone gets motivated the same way. Uh, how do they like to work? Now in this, you know, where we are today, and, you know, what's the balance with respect to hybrids? You like to, you prefer to work at home. You like to be in the office. You want to mix. Um, um, what's your what are your career aspirations? Um, are you happy to do I, this? That's so it, it even it even flows into sort of reward and recognition, doesn't it? Because we typically have these sort of reward and recognition schemes that are vanilla playing exactly the same for everyone. But, you know. If the big thing in the company is, I don't know, they've got some big town hall and they try to you know, put people up on a pedestal, there's a lot of people that absolutely hate that and can't imagine anything worse. But they actually might really care about the fact that you know, they might be a, I don't know, an equestrian horse rider or something. And so you buy them you know, tickets to an equestrian event or something that takes them on a, you know, a weekend trip somewhere, they'll think that's so much more meaningful than you know, whatever it was that was the standard kind of company approach. It reminds me actually of my, uh, probably my first I would, maybe not quite a super boss, but very close who uh, in the way in, in sales where he knew that I had a very strong motivation to buy a property. 
Uh, and so with me, and he didn't do it with anybody else, but he knew it was so motivating for me. After every single sale, he would get his commission calculator out and he would tell me exactly how much commission I'd made towards my house. And he built like a little um, picture of this house. And so we'd, we'd kind of talk about it once a week in our meetings. He knew that was my motivator. And so he specifically tailored that conversation for me, but it wasn't something standard for everyone. So yeah, I, I really, I agree with you there. Yeah. And that just takes, I mean, it takes a little bit of work, but it's not impossible to, uh, it's not impossible to mm. do. And, and very importantly, the sewer boss leaders will talk about um, people's careers and what they want. And they do something really unusual, I think, uh, in the sense that um, um, they, they, want, they want to understand, well, what are your aspirations? Uh, you want my job? You want my boss? You know, my boss's job? You want to uh, create your own company? You want to do a spin out? Um, we're, and you're allowed to, you know, you're allowed to change what, your life. You could change anything you want. But what, what is you? And, and then the question is, okay, well, if this is what you want to do, let's think together a little bit about what skills and capabilities you're going to need to make that happen. And let's see where you are today. And let's see if by doing your job with, uh, on this team, let's see if we can help you build some of those skills um, as part of your job now. And imagine, imagine the reaction of people that get treated that way. All of a sudden, you have flipped the switch and they're working for themselves, even though they're working for you as part of the, part of the team. And the loyalty that you get is tremendous. And that's what they do. I think that's a, that is a fascinating point. We had a, a guest and I've, I've used her metaphor so many times because I found it so impactful. Um, where we talk about this, this issue with often founders who are really focused on retention and because they think retention is the holy grail. And retention is good, but it's kind of a byproduct, I think, of all the things that you're talking about, the way that people are treated on the way through, like if they if they stay because they're loyal, because you, you know, they're getting all the other things, then retention is a sort of natural outcome. It's, it's an output, not an input. Um, but why do people focus on retention? Because often they're scared and they're sort of they think they have this this mindset that hasn't quite shifted yet to think, well, I just need to hang on to this person for as long as possible, as opposed to what you've just talked about, which is to say, well, if business is a sort of series of bus stops. You know, some people are going to need to be on from bus stop A to B and some will get off at B and new people will get on and those people will be on from B to C and some people will stay all the way up to E and E and F. But the assumption is my job as your leader is to help you maximize your contribution and your growth between each of these stops and whichever one you get off on, that's totally fine. That's kind of what I expect. And I don't know when that's going to be. That's your decision to make. But my job is actually to help you for, for the company to help get the most out of you and for you to get the most out of that journey. So the, the focus becomes contribution uh, rather than uh, how, do, how, do we, how do we get them to contribute and help them contribute it's, uh, the most it's quite as opposed controversial, to retain them like a sort of- I've had I'm more than one CEO tell me I was completely kind of nuts when I was doing the research, uh, actually close to writing the book. And I would go back to some CEO friends and tell them, here's what I'm finding. And, um, yeah, and, right. and, and, and one of the implications is that you're going to end up losing some of your best people. This is going to happen. And one CEO told me, are you out of your mind? He had a few other words in there, adjectives. Uh, why would I want to do that? Why would, I want, why would I want to let my best people go? And the entire story is in the verb in that sentence, let. Is it the case that any executive, any, any one of us can force people to work, to work for us? It doesn't work that way. Everyone's a free agent. Anyone could do what they want to do. And so uh, right away, you're framing it in a way that, that, that first of all, it's mm -hmm. not consistent with the world as it ever was and certainly as it is today uh with you know so much mobility and movement and it's and it's actually hurting you it, you, you don't gain anything with that with that mindset because it means that if somebody leaves you're upset with them you know don't don't let the door hit you on the way out and what you've ended up doing and i've uh, i've said this to 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 a lot of people um what you end up doing when you have that mindset and somebody leaves and you're just upset about it is you have now ended your total return on investment from that person. All the work you did, all the development, and whatever you did, whatever opportunities you created for him or for her, it's it's over because you've now created this barrier. Wouldn't it be smarter to think about how to continue that return on investment? Which is what happened. This is what some of these super boss leaders are very, very clever. This is more, my example is a bit more for senior leaders, uh, but you have, uh, there's one company, um, hospital company, that had a senior executive that, um, was being recruited by headhunters to become CEO of, a, of other companies. And he's obviously a, a star. And the CEO of his boss, the CEO of this hospital care company said, why don't we do the spinoff and create a whole series of mental health clinics? You'll be the CEO of that. 
we'll fund you and you'll get equity in that. You won't just be a hired hand for someone else, you'll get equity in it. And we also will invest with it. In other words, you know, we'll support you. We're going to give you an opportunity you couldn't easily get on your own, but we're going to make some money at the same time. And it's just a smart way to think about things. Uh, yeah. It is super smart. Actually, the, the the boss, when I was making my transition out of executive leadership roles into my first CEO role, I was petrified of having that conversation. I'd had this amazing leader and we'd built an incredible relationship and he'd really, really backed me and supported me. And I was like, I really want to be the CEO. Like, I, I kind of want end-to-end accountability. I want to test myself and see how I go. And and we looked extensively about opportunities to do that within the group in the same way that you said, is there a way that we can do this in the kind of acquisitions that we're making where I can sort of take on that? Um, and we couldn't find the right opportunity. So I got full support in actually going and, you know, in being a referee and helping me in the process. And uh, and we remain close to this day and we still speak, you know, every three months or so. And I would then continue to if there was ever an opportunity where he was working on something, and this is to your point about the total return on investment, I would recommend anybody in a heartbeat work with that guy if they want to learn. Um, and so that return on investment that's will continue exactly for him what, every time uh, I find a super talented person. I'd be like, hey, you should work for this mindset. guy. That's a, maybe a little bit um, uncom- what he's doing. It's Get a little bit uncomfortable if you grew up in a certain way where, as you said earlier, talent retention is everything. And that's the metric that that you, that you look at. Um, and um, yeah, it, 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 you, you just end up, hurt, you end up hurting yourself. Mm. Are there, I know you've got, I mean, I know that there's, all, there's obviously well, a lot in you know, your book. Are there any kind of other key ones that you want to really want to talk about in terms of those key characteristics or behaviors that we haven't covered kind of that you now, think right? should make up the super um, boss? What do they do that's different than other bosses? And I'd say that there's, there's several yeah. things, but I'm going to say two things that, that stand out. One is that they, uh, that they become talent spotters or talent scouts or whatever word you want to use. Wherever they go, they're on the lookout for great people. And, and whether that's, you know, someone in the industry or, or else. So I've heard this story many times you at a restaurant and the server is just really great. We've all had those experiences. They make you feel better. You enjoy the, 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 the experience. Um, Superboss leaders will strike up a conversation with that server and they're mm-hmm. not leaving before giving him or her their business card and saying, if you ever want to have a cup of coffee and talk about potential opportunities in my company or my team, I'd love to talk to you about it. And why is that? Because mm. a, an excellent server in a restaurant has a certain skill set. We have words for that in business called customer relationships, relationships skills, um, uh, customer service, uh, sales. All those, all those like critical skill sets are bundled up in in things that you know maybe maybe are not fully uh, appreciated sometimes. Mm. Um, uh, and so being a being a talent scout means wherever you go, you're on the lookout. And and I look at it and I say. Mm. This is maybe more for bigger companies because, you know, sm- more entrepreneurial companies won't have big HR departments to be sure. But why would we want to outsource what we always say is the single most important thing, our, our, our talent, our people? Why would we want to outsource that to our HR team or HR person, no matter how good they are? Why wouldn't we want to be involved ourselves? We would never treat any other asset that way where we'd be hands off. And if we say it's the most important asset. So, so the first suggestion or idea that comes from super bosses is to be a talent scout, a talent spotter. Um, and that's not just you. You could, you could, you could teach other people to do it. You could talk about that. You could even reward people for that. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was going to say, I, I actually expected my leadership teams to allocate a minimum percentage of their week um, every week to exactly that. It's like, if you don't know the best people in industry, how are we going to ever attract them into the, cause they're not sitting around waiting for jobs to turn up on the, on the job boards. These are all going to come from relationships. So you, it's almost, it's like a minimum KPI that you need to be talent pooling all the time. You've got to be out there searching, having coffees, having meetings, you know, be, be unafraid of going and tapping those people. It's on the actually and what um, deal makers do as well, right? For companies, venture capitalists, uh, private equity, you want to be in the deal flow. You need mm-hmm. to know who's doing interesting stuff. So you got to get out there and talk to people. Doesn't mean you're necessarily going to want to acquire mm-hmm. any of these companies or invest in them, but you might. Um, the second idea is is a second uh, what I call mm-hmm. untapped talent pools. So we have such a shortage of talent uh, everywhere. Um, where are you looking for people? Where are you looking for talent? I, I, I don't know why this is, but so many organizations, so many people keep going back to the same source, the same place. Whether you know if they're hiring at a school or university. 
they, they have their, their two schools or whatever. Uh, or they always have, have to hire someone that has a certain engineering degree and that's all they're going to do or uh, w- whatever it happens to be. And what sewer bosses have done is, is they, and maybe this is part of the creativity as well, they've opened that up. They've taken the blinders off and said, okay, what are some potential talent pools that we've never looked at before or we've hardly looked at before that could potentially be, um, be valuable for us? And so um, actually there's a lot of uh, public school teachers that are getting hired by companies right now uh, because they have a variety of, of, I think, important skills that, um, that haven't been considered before. But the most common groups would be, um, uh, let's say, women who left the workforce because they wanted to be the stay-at-home mom for a period of time, and and they had a high-powered jobs, they're very capable. Um, often they have advanced degrees, and they just find it very difficult. Why should they find it very difficult? Get back, get mm-hmm. back in. This, this is like an incredible resource. Um, Ex-military. This is maybe more of a U.S. thing because there's so much, so many military everywhere. Mm-hmm. But they they're mm-hmm. retiring. They're coming back mm-hmm. after a tour mm-hmm. of duty, a tour, tour of service. They might not know what a spreadsheet looks like, but they sure know what leadership looks like because they've mm-hmm. dealt with things that, uh, you know, yeah. The, yeah. the typical employee has not dealt with and um, which is easier to teach them, you know, leadership in a battlefield or, or, or an Excel spreadsheet. I think we know the answer. Um, uh, I had a, I, t- I, I talked about this in a workshop I once did and there was a CEO from Ireland who had a small tech company and his problem was hiring coders, which is I think a problem for a lot of, a lot of places. The price keeps going up and up and up and mm-hmm. where are you going to find them? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. he, uh, ended up, um, tapping into really an untapped ta- uh, talent pool of people that were somewhat on the autism spectrum that had deep math logic skills they may not have been so good you know interpersonally mm-hmm. that wasn't mm-hmm. their strong suit but they, they it wouldn't it wasn't hard to teach mm-hmm. them how to code mm-hmm. and they became among the best coders in the entire company and that breaks a lot of rules if you think if you think about mm-hmm. that um, uh, so mm-hmm. it's just a matter mm-hmm. of being open-minded and creative i can give you literally another another five different examples all you know all unusual yeah i can think of i can think of lots of those too yeah i know that i remember hearing a story about um somebody who was trying to build their sales team and they realized actually the kind of perfect profile for them in their kind of sales business was people who'd been chasing a professional sporting career who'd had an injury and so therefore were out of the professional sporting career. They kind of got through their university um, sort of level studies and they had therefore the team orientation, they had ambition, they were great at goal setting, they were really disciplined, they had sort of, you know, a very engaging kind of characters, um, but they had a, an immediate career change. So they kind of look for that trigger for somebody who just dropped out of the sport and they'd go immediately and talk to them. Or, you know, when we think about um, cybersecurity, uh, you know, people going into cybersecurity, when you think, okay, well, what's some of the skill sets that really translate nicely into cybersecurity? Accountants. Accountants are excellent at spotting, you know, errors in patterns, um, you know, pulling together reports. You know, they're really interesting, um, interesting cohort for people looking for cybersecurity professionals rather than looking for the people who are already trained in it, you know, retrain accountants um, who are all of a sudden going to go from a fifty or sixty thousand dollar job to an eighty or ninety thousand dollar job in the, you know, in the blink of an eye because they happen to be in a more in demand sector. Yes, exactly. Those are great. Those are great examples. And and just you know that's what I would say to to mm. people. Just start kind of get get out of your way. Start thinking a bit openly. And you could in the space of ten minute brainstorming with, with a friend, even let alone your team, you'd come up with uh, several several mm. avenues, seven possible uh, several possibilities, and then just dig into it to see which mm. which makes sense, and then experiment a little bit. So, Dan, I'm dying to ask you what. Uh, what leadership behavior, what's the worst, you know, or most common leadership behavior that perhaps is, has sort of unintentional but damaging consequences? You know, sometimes I always think some stuff is relatively overt and other people can see it, um, but there's often a whole bunch of stuff in a leader's blind spot. You know, the stuff that they do, they're doing, they don't realize they're doing, this kind of insidious behavior that starts to erode your ability to build the kind of relationships that you want with your team. Um are there, are there things that through your research that you found are the, the sort of watch fors, you know, like if you're noticing yourself doing this, really need to start thinking pretty quickly. You may not be down in the, okay, you're going to be failing yet, but you might be slipping from that middle ground or you might actually be on the way up to super boss, but you've got a couple of things that are actually going to be derailing your best efforts. You know, this is a great, is a great question. There's probably a bunch of things, but the one that pops to mind is maybe it sound a little bit strange, but it's overvaluing your own personal experience um, and even your own successful experience. Mm. What do you mean by experience that? is is great. 
you know, if, if you and I met at some cocktail party, we start talking, what are we talking about? We're going to talk about our resumes indirectly. We talk about our jobs. Uh, it'll come up at some, at some point. So our experience as, as professionals is very closely tied into our identity. The problem is that as new challenges come, we continue to rely on that same experience base. And if that new problem or that new challenge is one is, is, is different, uh, and we continue to go back to kind of the same game plan, we're going to end up in trouble. And uh, and it's because of experience. And I've actually done some academic research on this in the context of mergers and acquisitions on why they fail. And I've seen it in other in other venues as well. When you, um, but it's a tricky one because we get hired for our experience, we get rewarded for our experience. So those are really good things. But uh, sometimes experience gets a little stale. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we don't keep reinvesting. Uh, in that experience. And sometimes that experience gets bypassed by a totally different way of thinking about it. But the worst thing that can happen is when we believe that, that experience puts us in a good position to solve problems. The only time that's true is when that problem you're facing is identical to one you solved before. Mm, that's so true. That's so true. Yeah, that's so interesting, isn't it? Um, you know, it's a really nice parallel with the concept that your business, you know, your business growth rate is never going to out, outstrip your personal growth rate. Because if you're not continuing to learn, then you are the main, especially if you're the founder, right? You know, you're the main bottleneck. Mm-hmm. And if you're, if you're not continuing to reinvent your, your own skills and level up and think differently, uh, to your point, you're going to, you're just relying on essentially whatever got you to here, but that's not necessarily what's going to get you to there. That's, yeah. that, that's you a great. You used a good word on that when you said learning. Um, I didn't mention that, but super boss leaders love to learn. And that's why they're open to criticism, to feedback, to different things that they haven't thought of. Mm-hmm. As long as it's, you know, you got to be able to defend your point of view. They're mm-hmm. not exactly going to say, oh, yeah, that's great. That uh, mm-hmm. I never thought of that. And you're right. You know, you got to have some data. You got to be able to argue. You mm-hmm. got to stand up shoulder to shoulder. But that's the way it should be. They mm-hmm. love They love to learn. Mm. That's beautiful and probably a great place for us to uh, to wrap up our conversation today. Sydney, thank you so much um, for the work that you've done, the work that you published. I mean, that's a huge amount of research and it takes a lot of a lot of personal effort uh, and sacrifice to do the level of research you've done to then produce the kinds of thoughts that you have and then be able to share that with the world. So we really appreciate you trying to condense that for us uh, today for our audience. And I know they will have got a lot of gold uh, from you there. How do people get in contact with you or follow along with what you're doing and, and kind of, and, and, and find out more about the, your concepts? So um, I always say, I don't play hard to get when you Google my name, you see all sorts of stuff come up, but the things that the two things that I'm doing most recently that I'm really excited about is, is the podcast, the Sidcast, mm-hmm. where I interview, kind of like you're doing. You're a great interviewer, so I'm enjoying it very much on the other oh, side you. of the uh, microphone. Um, and, and I talk to interesting people in different walks of life. They're not all leaders. Some are in entertainment. Some are in, in, in sports. Some are academics doing interesting work. And, and that's been really enjoyable and lots of uh, lots of great lessons. And then the second thing is just just launching now is a series of courses for Coursera, which is the world's biggest online oh. education company. They have something like 100 million learners. And uh, so I'm going for 1%. I think 1 million is a good number. Yeah. And um, actually what I did is I created four courses for them, um, which they call a specialization. You get a certificate if you actually do it all. And they're courses you cannot get any anywhere else because it's kind of, they're based on my books, they're based on my experiences, the things I've worked on uh, that, that I've done. And they're extremely applied. I created um, over 60 application exercises that uh, enable you to, to take the ideas that I share and say, okay, how, what does that mean for me? How would I do it? Um, how, how can that help me get better? And um, awesome. so I'm very excited about that. And um, and I think it's going to be- How soon will they come out? Uh, they're they're, they're, they're out they're as we speak. They just, just came out. Oh, awesome. Okay, brilliant. Well, we're at uh, April 2022. So if you haven't been on Coursera before, get on, go on and get amongst it and, um, and check out Sydney's work. It's called Strategic Leadership. So that's the way to find it or, or with my okay. name. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. That's wonderful. Well, uh, I very much encourage the audience to get on, get amongst, uh, go and get amongst that. Thank you so much, Sydney. Folks, I hope you enjoy the show. Huge thanks to Sydney Finkelstein. Uh, a couple of things before you go. If you've got value from today, of course, please um, share it with a friend, take a screenshot, post it on Instagram, You know, leave a review. However you can help um, Sydney's message get out into the world, the more people uh, get the benefit from it. So thank you very much. And just remember, folks, the only thing that can prevent you from fully ever having the opportunity to scale is giving up. So you have to remain unshakable in your faith that you're going to get there and then you continue to adapt and change and learn uh, along the ways we've been talking about today. Thank you so much, Sydney. Uh, you've been listening to the Scale Let's podcast. I'm Sean Steele.
and look forward to speaking to you again next week. G'day everyone, just a couple of quick things before you go. If you have questions that you'd love myself or an upcoming guest to tackle about challenges that you're facing in scaling your business, please just jump straight on the website, scaleupspodcast.com. You can record your message straight from your mobile by hitting the button on the right-hand side of the page, or you can just email them the old-fashioned way, questions at scaleupspodcast.com. And just a quick reminder, nothing we spoke about today constitutes financial or business advice. If you are considering making big decisions in your business, seek out a professional who can look at your situation in detail and make sure you're getting sound, personalized advice. Thanks for listening. Look forward to being back in your podcast feed next week.